It's your move. It's your move. Now, if we were playing chess, that would mean that you have somewhere between one and 218 different options. The average chess player, when they are engaged with another opponent, has on average about 40 different options every move that they make. Uh, a grandmaster, a chess grandmaster, might be able to uh, remember or calculate about 30 to 35 different moves in their head, but but the the average player only post, only only can process about a half a dozen different options when it's their move. Now the game of chess originated in a, somewhere around 700 A.D. in India. It was a, a game called Chaturanga. And that merged with a Persian board game that was called Shatranj. And uh, those two games came together and for centuries were played by traders in the, in the Near East. And, and the game eventually migrated to Europe. In fact, the Persian word, the, the word for Shaimat, which uh, means the king is helpless, or the shah is helpless, is a literal transliteration of the word that we use in chess for checkmate. Well, at about, in about the year 1475, uh, the Italians and the Spaniards, who had become proficient at this game of chess, settled on the final form of what we call classic chess. It was an eight by eight board with 64 squares, and each player had 16, 16 pieces, eight pawns, two rooks, two knights, two bishops, and a king and a queen. And what the Italians and the Spaniards decided in 1475 was which player on the board would be the most powerful. And they agreed that the most powerful player on the board would be the queen. And for centuries, classic chess was known as Mad Queen Chess, because the queen was the most powerful player or the most powerful piece in a chess match. People have calculated the, the mathematics of chess, chess, and there was a mathematician a number of years ago who said, I wonder if the number of moves that are possible in a chess match are infinite. And he made calculations about how many potential different moves could be engaged in any circumstance on a chessboard. It's sort of a butterfly effect. Well, how did it play out? And his calculation reached the conclusion that at the beginning of any chess match, there are 10 to the 120th power number of possible ways the game could be played. In fact, Another mathematician calculated that after two players engage in five moves each, just 10 moves into a game, you have eliminated 69,352,859,712,417 different possibilities have been eliminated by just five moves per player. Now it has been said that chess is a lot like life, that it is filled with complicated choices and there are an infinite number of options. And I would respectfully disagree with that because life is way more complicated than chess. Because you've got rogue pieces that just break their own rules and they do whatever they want and you've got, you've got, you've got murder hornets and sharks with lasers and sharknadoes and all kinds of imaginary enemies just dropping in winged monkeys and dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. The world is far more complicated than a game of chess, which leaves us in a situation that I think all of us are very aware of right now, confused, paralyzed, what do we do? How do we even navigate in a world that is filled with almost infinite uncertainty and complexity? 
It seems like every way we turn, there are, there are wrong answers and, and terrible outcomes, and, and we're struggling to know just how to move at all. Last week, I suggested that in this complicated world, in a world that continually surprises us and, and shocks us with the, the unfolding of events, that if we can just remember four simple things, we can navigate through the most complex of times. It's four steps, actually. And, and what I suggested is that the first step is to draw a line in the dirt to take a stand. Take a stand, stand up and say, this is what I believe. And as for me, this is where I will plant my flag. This is the line from which I will not retreat. That we define what we really believe, what we're willing to die for. Take a stand, stand up, identify your core beliefs. The second step is to just put one foot in front of the other and step out. Just to, just, to, just to move in a direction, to press into life, and to do it by doing the next right thing. The third step is, is to not quit because we'll all fall and we'll all fail and life will surprise us and, and, and knock the breath out of us and trip us up. But when it does, press on. Don't give up. Don't quit. And the fourth step is to celebrate, to rejoice, to give thanks, to find the good in things, to constantly, relentlessly rejoice and be thankful and celebrate. And in these four simple steps, I believe we can enter into the complexity and the insanity of the world that we live in with a confidence. And today, I'd like to challenge us to consider stepping out, to consider doing the next right thing. Define what you believe and then act on that belief and do the next right thing. See, it's my prayer today. It's my prayer today and on Father's Day. On Father's Day of all days, that, that there, there would be men and women in our community, in our congregation, in our world who are courageous enough to say, this is what I believe, here I stand, and now I will choose to do the next right thing. I think that's a very courageous thing for any father to do, to say, this is what I will do. I will man up, and I will be a man of my word, and I will do the next right thing. But it's not just men, it's men and women, it's children, it's all of us. And it's my prayer that we would, we would have the courage and we would have the commitment to simply do the next right thing. I know that sounds easy, but I, it's, it's really complicated. Sometimes it's really hard. So I want to offer some suggestions. If you don't know what the next right thing is, all you need is Emily Post's book of etiquette. Emily Post uh, began the 20th century as, as a columnist. And she gave advice to people in social circles on how to behave in social settings. This is the 18th edition of Emily Post's book of manners for a new world. And here's some of the things, if you don't know what the next right thing is, just listen to Emily Post. Here's what she says. Never take more than your share, whether of the road in driving your car, of chairs on a boat, or seats on a train, or food at the table. The next right thing. The only occasion when the traditions of courtesy permit a hostess to help herself before a woman guest is when she has reason to believe the food is poisoned. She says, manners are a sensitive awareness of the feelings of others. If you have that awareness, you have good matters, no matter which fork you use. Keep your hands to yourself might almost be put at the head of the first chapter of every book on etiquette. 
And then she says, to make a pleasant and friendly impression is not only good manners, but equally good business. You see, I believe that the next right thing is the next small thing. That, that the next right thing may be just politeness or thankfulness or gratitude that the nice right thing may not be a great decision, but if we get in the habit of focusing on the details, of focusing on the small things, the next right thing, then the big things seem to be less intimidating. Last week, I began to share with you a story about a, story about a woman who lived in very confusing times story about a woman named Ruth who lived 3,300 years ago. It was a time that the Bible calls the period of the judges. It was during this time that there was no king in the nation of Israel. Joshua had led the people out of the Exodus to claim their inheritance in Palestine, and they were settling into the land. And during that time, the, land, the nation of Israel was ruled by judges like Samson and Ehud and Samuel. But it tells us that during that time, every man did what was right in their own eyes. It was 3,300 years ago, but it might have been yesterday. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And, and I wanted to introduce us to this woman named Ruth a woman of foreign ancestry, a Moabitess, who married a Jewish young man who died. She was a widow, and she was living with her Jewish mother-in-law named Naomi. And in the first chapter of Ruth's story, she takes a stand. She says to her mother-in-law, who wants to return to her ancestral home in Bethlehem, she says, don't beg me to leave you. Because where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. I put the stake in the ground, and here I stand. But then, as they return to Bethlehem, Ruth moves out and does the next right thing. It says that once they returned to Bethlehem, the Naomi and Ruth returned to this small village. It probably couldn't have been more than 100 or 200 people. It was just outside of the, of the city walls of Jerusalem, but it was a rural community. And when, when Naomi and, and Ruth returned to, to Bethlehem, they... they they were recognized. A, a few people who remembered Naomi from 15 or 20 years earlier recognized her, and they said, Is, can this possibly be Naomi, the one who left almost 20, perhaps even 25 years ago? And she says, no, 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 don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Mara is the Hebrew word for bitter. She said, I am bitter because, because the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, has taken everything from me. I left Bethlehem full, but I come back empty. Don't call me Naomi. Call me bitter. Now, before you get all judgy about Naomi and say, whoa, she's, this is a woman with a problem. This is a woman with an attitude. Think about what she had been through. When she left Bethlehem, they left in a famine. And the irony of that shouldn't escape us, because the name Bethlehem means city of bread. They left the city of bread because there was no bread. And they crossed over the Transjordan Valley into the land of the, of the fish people, of the dirt people, of the Moabites, who worshiped the fish god Shemosh on the eastern shores of the Dead Sea. And they cobbled out a life there, and then Naomi's husband, Elimelech, died. Her two sons married Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. And for 10 years, they managed to, to make a living there in Moab. Perhaps it was comfortable, but then without warning, her two sons, Malan and Killian, died. And she was left with her two daughters-in-law, Moabite women, and no hope at all. 
She had every reason to be, to be bitter, to be angry, to be frustrated, to be confused. Like many of us have very good reason right now to say, I don't get it. I don't understand what's going on. But the book in the Bible is not called the book of Naomi. It's called the book of Ruth. Because even though Ruth had every reason to be just as bitter as Naomi and to be just as angry at her God, she chose to do the next right thing. When they returned to Bethlehem, uh, Ruth asked her mother-in-law, would you permit me to go into the fields and glean behind the harvesters? Gleaning was a common practice. It was the welfare program of the ancient world. It was the social security that had been established as a custom throughout the Middle East. In fact, it was a law that God had given to Moses in the Torah. In the third book of the Torah, in the book of Leviticus, in Leviticus chapter 19, God's people are instructed that during the harvest, they are not to cut the corners of their field, and they are not to go back and be obsessive about picking up the stalks or the grains that fall as they are cutting the wheat or the barley or the grain. And they are to leave that in the field for the poor and the foreigners. And Ruth was, in fact, a poor foreigner. And so Naomi gave her daughter-in-law, Ruth, permission to go out into the fields to glean, to see what she might gather to sustain she and her mother-in-law at least for a few days. And so she went out and, and she started gleaning in a field and it just so happened that the owner of the field began, came to that field that day and he saw this woman who was obviously not from Bethlehem. She was a foreign woman and he asked his overseer, his foreman, he said, who is that woman? And the overseer said, her name is Ruth. She came to me and asked permission if she might glean in the fields. And she is the daughter-in-law of Naomi. Remember the one who came back after 20 or 25 years? And she is here to support her mother-in-law, Naomi, and take care of her family. And the owner of the field was a man named Boaz. And Boaz said, well, I want you to take care of this woman. Allow her to glean, because, because gleaning in, the, in that time was really not not a, a, an activity that was available to anyone. The gleaners in the field would bring their wives and their children. It was kind of like a bonus payment. And their wives and children would typically glean in the field and take home the extra grain for themselves. But Boaz, the landowner, said, I want you to protect this woman. And, and so Ruth gleaned throughout the entire day well into the night and in the evening she threshed the grain and it tells us that when she went home to Naomi she carried back a full ephah of grain a full basket of grain Naomi asked her whose field she had been in and she told her and and they had supplies and provisions because Ruth did the next right thing You know, this seems obvious, but if you're like me and you're a planner, this is never easy. See, I'm a planner. I'm a guy, and I don't know, some of you who know me, you go, well, Dave, you're such a happy-go-lucky guy. You're just a free spirit. We never know what you're going to do. You're just, you're just, you just kind of run wild. No, 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 no. The, the real Dave likes to plan. And, and my favorite thing to plan, my favorite thing to plan are projects and vacations. I love planning vacations. It's like having an extra vacation. So, so it's, the, it's the planning of it and the anticipation of it and the expectation of it. For me, it's kind of a mental vacation. And then I actually go on the vacation. So it usually takes me about a year, a year and a half to plan what I consider to be a real vacation. And so last year, I started planning our vacation for this year. And here's my file folder. 
Colorado 2020. And I had this great plan. We have this Jeep, Diane and I have this Jeep, and I thought, you know, baby, what we're going to do is we're going to go to Colorado, and we're going to go four-wheeling all up and down the Rocky Mountains. And, and my wife was game. She was like, okay, you know, we, we could do that. And she was asking me about some of the trails we were going on, and, and I was saying, well, some of them are a little technical. And at some point, she never really said this. She kind of implied four-wheeling is fun for the person who's driving. Four-wheeling is no fun at all. If you're the passenger for six hours, fearing for your life the whole time. So she knew I would have had a great time. And she also reminded me that Colorado is not exactly down the road. We would have to drive in a loud, noisy Jeep all the way up through Amarillo, all the way up to Colorado, drive around on the mountain roads, and then drive back. So I nixed, the, I nixed the Jeep trip, even after I had bought six books on Colorado Jeep trails. And I said, OK, we'll, we'll make this a trip where we'll visit friends. And we'll fly up, and we'll rent a car, and we'll go to Ure, Colorado. My, uh, one of my best friends from Dallas rents a house every summer in Ure. I don't know if you know where Ure is. It's up in western Colorado. And he says, you got to come up for the 4th of July. He's been telling me this for years, because the entire town of Ure goes completely insane. And they do 4th of July like nobody else. And he said, come stay at our house. And we were going to go to Ure, stay at his house. And then we were going to go to Aspen. I've never been to Aspen. And I met a guy and his wife last year who live in Aspen. And I really like him. And I was hoping to reconnect with them. And then we have a, a really dear friend from, from Austin who has a home in Beaver Creek. And we were going to hopefully stop in and see her. And then we were going to go to Denver. And we were going to see a young couple whose wedding I did three years ago. I haven't seen them since. They just had their first baby. And I was hoping to reconnect with them. But the real highlight of the trip was going to be we were going to go to a concert at Red Rocks to see one of our favorite bands, the Avid Brothers. We we're going to see the Avid Brothers at Red Rocks. If you're a music fan, that, that was going to be like the pinnacle of the trip. But the, but the thing that I was most excited about for this trip was I saved up for a year. And for two weeks, I was going to rent a Porsche. We were going to drive around the Colorado mountain roads in a Porsche, and you can bet I was getting the extra insurance because I was driving the wheels off of that car. I was so looking. This is this is these are the maps. These are the hotel reservations, the flight reservations, all of the details of where we were going to go. You know when we're leaving on that trip? Never. We're not going because two months ago. I realized the next right thing for me to do was to be here, was to be here this summer. And I realized how hard it is to say, OK, here's what I expected. Here's what I planned. Here's what I hoped for. And then to say, no, 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 I'm not going to do that because it's not the right thing. I'm going to do the next right thing instead. But that's the interesting thing about the story of Ruth. The story of Ruth is like, and the Bible is this. This is what the Bible is. The Bible is like, like, like a CT scan on life. It pulls the curtain back. It's like a microscope that shows us the things that are going on that we really can't see. All we can see is, is here's your decision. Are you going to do the next right thing or not? But behind the scenes, God is at work. And in the book of Ruth, we see where God was at work all along. It's what I call the divine coincidence. You see, coincidentally, Naomi and Ruth returned to Bethlehem, it says, at the beginning of the barley harvest. Not in the middle, not at the end, not the, one of the 51 weeks of the year when the barley harvest wasn't taking place. They arrived exactly coincidentally on the very beginning of the barley harvest. Ruth, coincidentally, just happened to go to the field of a man named Boaz, who was from the tribe of Naomi's husband, Elimelech. 
And it just so happened that Boaz showed up in the field that day, her first day. It just was a coincidence that he just happened to show up there. And it was just a coincidence that Boaz turns out to be a very substantial man. I like to think of Boaz as Bo Jackson. When I think of Bo Jackson, it's kind of like intimidating, cool, really good looking man who comes in, who has his stuff together. Boaz, I mean, you can understand that. I guess Boaz would be Bo and Bo Jackson and good looking man. And, and, and he comes in and he does the right thing. And he says, let this woman glean. And he, and he looks out for her and he protects her and he cares for her. And he looks out and he says to his, he says to his employees, you need, you need to leave an extra measure for her. So that at the end of the day when she left, it says she left with a bushel, a bushel basket, a, an ephah of grain. That's like 50 or 60 pounds of grain. It wasn't like she had a jar so they could go home and have a falafel the next day. They had a bushel basket, a thousand ounces of grain that would not only feed them for a substantial time, it was grain that they could then barter for other food or for a place to live. And she kept going back throughout the barley harvest to the fields of Boaz. And just coincidentally, when she goes home, she tells Naomi, Naomi says, well, whose field did you, did you glean in? And she said, I, I was in the field of a man named Boaz. And Naomi says, well, well, Boaz is a distant cousin of mine. In fact, Boaz is our Goel. Goel was, was sort of the Hebrew equivalent of, of sort of the patriarch. In the Old Testament law, in the Hebrew law, there was, a, there was an implicit understanding that the most influential member of any clan or any tribe would take responsibility for the welfare of the entire tribe, and they were called the Goel. They were called the kinsman redeemer or the guardian redeemer. And it just so happens, just coincidentally, oh, by the way, that Ruth happened to go to the field of the Goel of Naomi's tribe, of the clan of Elimelech. You see, I believe that when we do the next right thing, if we do the thing that is right in front of us, that is the proper thing, the correct thing, the right thing, then God takes care of the other things that we cannot control but it's up to us to do the next right thing. I may not be able to figure everything out, but I can figure out that. And when I don't know what to do, I consult Emily Post. And I ask her, you know, what should I be doing there, Emily? And you may say, well, come on, Dave. I mean, it's not like you thumb through this every time you have to make a decision. And you may say, Emily Post has been doing this for 100 years. She's got to be dated. Well, you're right. Here, here are some of Emily Post's advice. The attributes of a great lady may still be found in the rule of the four S's, sincerity, simplicity, sympathy, and serenity. I have three daughters. <laughs> no. Um, here's, an, here's another piece of advice from Emily Post. It is impossible for a hatless woman to be chic. Really. A lady never asks a gentleman to dance or to go to supper with her. And a lady also never goes on a date. Here's another one. If God had intended for women to wear slacks, he would have constructed them differently. Is she talking about the slacks or the woman? I, I can't even go there. Here's, here's another one. A gentleman should never take his hat off with a flourish. Can't tell you how many times I violated that rule. And then, then there's this little piece of advice. A gentleman does not boast about his junk. I don't think that means what you think it means right now. I think it means like the mess in his life. But you see, I have this theory. I have this theory about things like manners. 
about things like yes ma'am and yes sir and no ma'am and no sir about please and thank you about politeness about 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 allowing people to kind of cut in front of you in line and holding the door for them and and my theory is that if you can do the the small things if you can do the right small things then doing the right big things take care of themselves that it's in the details in the small moves that the game is won. You see, we take a stand and we say, this is where I stand. This is what I believe. And then once we take a stand, we step out and we say, what is the next right thing? What should I do? And in the complexity of life, it's like a chess match. It's discerning what is the next right move. To be a grandmaster in chess, you have to have what's called an ELO score. ELO was a mathematician who calculated, uh, it created this massive algorithm of calculations that rank, uh, rank world-renowned chess players. And the ELO scale considers how many games you play, how many matches you win, the ranking of the people who are your opponents, and, and all of these factors go in. And, and basically, to be considered a grand master in chess, you have to have an ELO score of greater than 2,500. In the year 2003, there was a 13-year-old Norwegian boy named Magnus Carlsen who scored a 2,500 on his ELO score. He had been the under 12 world champion the year before, but he was the youngest person ever to be considered a grandmaster at 13. Before he turned 18 years old, he had an ELO score of over 2,800. And there were only four other people in the world who had a score that high. By the time he was 20, he was number one in the world. And in 2013, he won the World Chess Championship at 23 years old. At the age of 24, in 2014, he had the highest ELO score ever recorded. The most people, most mathematicians believe it's impossible to have an ELO score of 2,900. He has scored, Magnus Carlsen, 2882, two times. In 2014, 60 Minutes did a profile of Magnus Carlsen, and they showed this clip. Booty, get that. Just look at what he's doing. Booty, look at that. Competing against 10 players simultaneously. That in itself is not extraordinary, but Magnus cannot see the boards. He's facing the other way. So he has to keep track of the positions of 320 pieces blind. And the number of possible moves? Infinite. Magnus comes out on top. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Do you have any idea how extraordinary this looks to... No, it's uh, one of the amazing things in chess that you can... You, can, you don't really need a board, you can just keep but it... But it, it transcends chess. I mean, I just... Uh, I, I just can't fathom what you've just done. It's just, no. it seems like it's supernatural. So how does he do it? How does Magnus Carlsen play 10 games in his head without seeing the board? Is it just a parlor trick? Is he just showing off? He does what every grandmaster does. He just makes one move at a time. He just makes the next right move. And in that sense, it's simple. He's not playing 10 opponents. He's not playing 10 different games. He's not calculating every possibility. He's simply saying, what is the next move, the next right move, and he does it. We are living in a world that is reminding us of how complicated it can be, 
how difficult it can be, ultimately how frustrating and how terrifying it can be. But it's a world that invites us to pay attention to the small things, to pay attention to the details, and do the next right thing. It's your move.